femininity as a frame is a way of seeing all aspects of humanity. These women that I was writing about in the Goddess book, they were involved in warfare, but they showed every characteristic. They were jealous, they were vengeful, they were loving, they were wise. They were all these characteristics, not just one thing. It's astonishing. I cannot quite believe that this book that I wrote, thinking it's a pretty hefty academic tome. It's got 108 pages of footnotes and bibliography and reference tools. Uh, and yet it's hitting a public uh, in a way that I never expected, which I think comes down to the subject matter. And it's a subject matter that we'll be discussing more throughout this evening that I think really should have been done a long time ago. I shouldn't have to write a book putting women back into history in 2022, 2023. It is so long overdue, it's almost frustrating. While I was writing Femina, I was writing this book, Goddess, and I want to bring in a little bit about that because it was all being written during the pandemic. And I began both these projects simultaneously with preconceptions about what I was going to write. And in the process of writing these books, my own preconceptions changed. I was changed in the process of writing these books. Um, why do we need to be having this conversation? Surely women have equality now, don't we? It's over, it's a done deal. No. There are more CEOs named John than there are women CEOs altogether. Any Johns in the room? <laughs> if, if so, well done, Johns. You're doing well in the world. Um, terrible, terrible statistic. It will take 108 years to close the gender gap. Um, this one surprised me. Only six countries give women equal legal rights to work as men. Um, again, you wouldn't think that's the case, but they have it. And so we have a long way to go. And we tend to think this journey is only about 100 years old. I mean, later on, we'll be talking about um, collectors from 100 years ago, how they were denied uh, the ability to express themselves through museum collections. Um, the person I begin Feminar with, Emily Wild-Davison, Wild the suffragette, she became the first martyr to the cause, and that was just over 100 years ago. But what I found so fascinating when I was thinking about this was that Emily Wilding Davidson was a medievalist like me. And she did not see what the suffragettes were doing at the turn of the century as breaking new ground, forging forward into a vacuum. What she was trying to do was regain rights that she felt women had in the medieval period that had been recently taken away from them. And that flipped everything around in my mind. I suddenly thought, right, so what, maybe I need to be looking differently at the period I study. Now, I'm taking about 25,000 years, <laughs> thought I'd start right at the beginning. Women have always been roughly 50% of the population, and finding them can be easier or harder depending on where you are and what time you're looking for them. Interestingly, back in the Neolithic, the prehistoric, there are multiple representations of women. These were until recently known as Venus figurines. Now that's nonsense, of course, because the Roman goddess Venus isn't even conceived of for another 20 odd thousand years. So instead, more accurate to refer to them simply as female figurines. This is the female figurine of Willendorf, and this is from Hollerfels in Germany. And I love these figures because they are clearly celebrating the female body and aspects of it that do loom large when we think about the binary difference between male and female, masculinity and femininity. In this case, reproduction. So the Hollerfels image here you can see this is a body, those marks are all contemporary. These are stretch marks that have been carved into the female body. And this is a, probably a body that has birthed children. What I love most about it though, is can you see there's no head? Instead, there's a little hook. And what this meant was when you wore it round your neck, 
your head became the head of the goddess. You were the goddess, which I think shows such creativity right from the very beginning of human artistic expression. And my journey to try and discover where, why we end up where we do in the Middle Ages and then in the modern age take, took me then 8,000 years back, 6,000 years BC, to Çatalhöyük, the world's oldest city in Turkey. Amazing place. This is what remains of it today. It's, it's vanishing before our eyes because the, the stone, the, the bricks were made out of sand and as they've been exposed, it's simply blowing away. Uh, but what the archaeologists discovered there in the 70s and the 80s was pretty much like a modern city today. Lots of standard-sized, similar-sized houses, all pressed up against each other. And they too have a form of goddess worship, it seems. This one, she is so formidable. And what I haven't shown you is the back of the statue, where she has a magnificent bottom that sort of drapes over the back of her throne. And she has subdued two panthers, Beneath her arms, she is, is, is um, above nature. She's ruling over nature. What is most fascinating about Chatelhoyak is when they did skeletal, exam, examine the skeletal remains that were found within the city. In almost every modern cemetery, every medieval cemetery, every classical cemetery, you can tell the difference between male and female bones from a range of evidence. For example, men often eat better than women. They often have different health issues, and largely their male uh, skeletons are bigger than the female skeletons. Well, at Chatelhoyak, they were not. They were very similar. They were eating the same things. They were doing the same jobs, the same labor. Dare I say it, but 8,000 years ago, did we have more equality than we have today? Then there are other examples of societies that actually work as a matriarchy. In Knossos, in Crete, the Minoan civilization, which predates the Greeks, their entire uh, palatial structure around Knossos was focused on the women. The women were the ones who made the decisions. They were in charge of the political sphere, the economic sphere, and the religious sphere. And here you have, again, two different representations of women. In this case, these are called snake goddesses, with the serpents winding around the arm on one. And in the other, she has two serpents in her hand, and again, a cat on her on her hat to show that she is on, in charge of nature. So all these ancient civilizations were giving me uh, inspiration to think about the relationship between the biological sexes, but also to start to challenge what we mean by gendered behaviors, things that are allocated in the male sphere and things that are allocated in the female sphere. I also wrote this book, Goddess, where I looked at different female figures of belief from across the world. And the thing is, I went into that project thinking, I know what a goddess is. It's Venus, it's a sort of naked lady, eternally beautiful, subdued, quiet. My goodness, how wrong I was. When I started to look at African Orishas and I started to look at Aztec goddesses that are sort of made out of obsidian and Rangda, the Balinese demon goddess whose head rips off and zooms around like a zombie at night, I realized, that what was actually happening across the world, across time, across belief, across cultures, was something far less binary. And femininity as a frame is a way of seeing all aspects of humanity. These women that I was writing about in the Goddess book, they were involved in warfare, but they showed every characteristic. They were jealous, they were vengeful, they were loving, they were wise. They were all these characteristics, not just one thing. And that's what I wanna, wanted to bring over into my examination of women in the Middle Ages. So, I did a lot of research for this book and for the other book. Luckily, there wasn't much on in sort of 21, 22, so I had a bit of free time to, to write. Um, and I realized that a lot of work has been done in the academic sphere on medieval women. Beautiful, brilliant books like Henrietta Leysner's Social History of Medieval Women, uh, Eileen Power's Study on Medieval Women. But in every case, when I was looking at these works, I'd cast my eye down the contents page, and each chapter was entitled something like daughter, mother, wife, sister. In every respect, these women were being 
explained in relation to the male counterparts in their lives. And I really didn't want to do that. <laughs> so I chose titles for my chapters that I think the first person you'd probably call to mind if I told you to imagine one of these people in the medieval period would be male. So the titles are movers and shakers, decision makers, warriors and leaders, artists and patrons, polymaths and scientists, spies and outlaws, kings, yes, kings, you read that right, and diplomats, entrepreneurs and influencers, exceptional and outcast. And that was really important to me because what I've tried to focus on in this book are, again, like with the goddess book, the range of human experiences represented by medieval women. Now, I try, I'm trying to do something different here as well because there are multiple books on women you should know from history. 50 great women you should know, 100 great women you should know. And you'll get two pages on Coco Chanel or Frida Kahlo and they're out of context. You get a bit about their life and then boom, onto the next great woman you should know. That's not what I wanted to do here. Yes, I'm introducing you to some extraordinary women, but I'm putting them back into their environment into the culture, and I'm surrounding them with the men and women, a full cast of people who we should know about. When I studied history at school, I got really put off by having to learn data, dates, details. It's all the acts of great men. And we are still in the thrall of the great man today. Just look at global politics. It's too easy to be under the thumb of the great man. But who else is left out of that story? everyone who isn't a great man, which frankly is sort of 0.1%. Everyone else, everyone of different classes, different races, different disabilities or abilities, different backgrounds, different sexualities and genders, all of those people are left out of the historical narrative. By putting the frame on women, which is the single largest sort of prism, 50 odd percent, I think we see everybody. I think we start to see all the other people who've been ignored. And it, having said that, by trying not to just do um, exclusion, exclusionary history, pick on one person and tell their story, I'm now going to pick on one person and tell their story because I want to introduce you to one of the superstars of the book, Hildegard of Bingham. This you might recognise. Yes, it is the cover. And Jenny and I will be discussing the cover a bit more later. But in this case, this is probably drawn by Hildegard herself, and she declares it to be a representation of the cosmic egg. If anyone else is thinking it's, it's something else, you're not wrong, okay? And I'll come up to that in a moment. Um, but her art is extraordinary. Now, I must put her in context. She's born in 1098 AD, so uh, lives 81 years, right the way through the 12th century in, uh, in the Rhineland in Germany. And I think she might be one of the most extraordinary people to have ever lived. So we know that she is this polymath. And one of the ways I describe her to people is she's Leonardo da Vinci, hundreds of years before Leonardo da Vinci, and better than Leonardo da Vinci because she finished her projects. Um, <laughs> She was a true polymath. She begins life in this uh, monastic environment in Dissy Bodenberg. Um, I will talk a little bit about terminology and how these things are important. But the idea that she is a nun may, from our modern perspective, kind of colour how we perceive her. I went to a convent school and my idea of a nun is a little old lady, very grey haired, tiny, in a habit, walking along in a herb garden with a ginger cat sort of strolling along, praying, separating themselves off from the world, living a life of, of piety and quiet contemplation. That is pretty much the opposite of what life would have been like at the time that Hildegard is running her multiple convents and double monasteries in Germany. Her environments were the universities, the hospitals, the music halls, the art centers, the, the technological workshops, craft shops of the Middle Ages. Anything intellectual, anything artistic, anything scientific, it would take place in these monastic environments. And a nun was someone who wielded 
power. They had a, they'd made a choice, or they'd had a choice made for them by their family, to leave behind the domestic sphere of child rearing, possibly dying in childbirth, being married um, you know, at the decision of their family. They remo they're removed from that into a space where they are allowed to learn, to think, to explore ideas. And of all of those nuns, Hildegard is the one that just seems to really stand out. Her visions began when she was a child, um, but she really, it seems, was suffering from migraines. And it was the migraines that was allowing her this sort of visionary experience. And I think you can see that in these images, can't you? They ra they're radial, which is quite unusual for medieval illumination. So they radiate outwards. There's this scotoma, the, the sort of metallic aspect. She instructed the uh, illuminators of these manuscripts to use gold and silver foil, which is unusual, because she wanted to get that kind of clash you get. So her descriptions of her, visit, of her visions are like that. But she uses these as a means of exploring the very meaning of life, existence, the universe. She writes theological texts. She writes scientific treaties, natural histories, where she discusses stones and flora and fauna. She's still known as the um, mother of uh, the natural sciences in Germany. She wrote music. And if you do one thing after this lecture tonight, go home and look up on YouTube, Hildegard of Bingham Music. It is sublime. She, uh, she makes the vocal, uh, she's written it for female voices. It's unlike anything else from the medieval period. And in one phrase, she'll jump two octaves. It's ethereal, it's otherworldly. So she's a musician, she's a linguist, she developed her own language. Um, an artist, you know, she's responsible for these things. So a true polymath and truly extraordinary at everything she turned her hand to. But what I think she was trying to do was understand the essence of life. When language isn't enough, can you invent a new language? When you can't express in words something that's so profound, can you use art or music? Can we explore it by understanding its science, its, its makeup, or do we need to think about it from a spiritual, philosophical point of view? She was casting all these lenses on life, and I can't think of a person alive today that was as capable as her. Luckily, she lived to 81, so she had a long time to enjoy it all. Um, this is her receiving her visions. But as I mentioned at the top, this is not about, woohoo, this is the celebrated human being we should all know about. It's about putting her in her environment and her context and understanding her in relation to the people around her. And here you can see her confidant, editor, if you like, Ricardus, who never left her side. Uh, there's some discussion that she may have been Hildegard's lover. Certainly, when she leaves the monastery, Hildegard just breaks down in passionate expressions of, of grief and loss and, and anger that she has been you know, left by this woman. Um, but in terms of her publishing career, she's always beside Hildegard, giving her advice, doing her research notes, helping her out. And this is the scribe Volmar, who was actually writing these things down and distributing them. And that's what you have to remember is, None of these women that appear in my book, um, the mystics, we wouldn't know their texts if there hadn't have been an army of monks and male supporters, male cheerleaders, lifting them up, raising them up. So it is about this environment of creativity where a woman is allowed to exceed the achievements of her male counterparts. Pretty much the only other person that's reaching the level of success and fame at the time of Hildegard is St. Bernard of Clairvaux. And he actually endorsed and supported Hildegard and promoted her career. So we are seeing a man and a woman on, a glo you know, on this, this international stage. She goes on a book tour. I'm on a book tour at the moment. And uh, I just think that's amazing, 800 years ago that she's on a book tour. Um, this is how she describes her visions. It's like a trembling flame or a cloud stirred by the clear air. And it's about around the age of 38, 39, 40, she begins to get a change in the complexion of her, of her migraines and a change in the complexion of her visions. Um, there is an argument it could have been menopause, early onset menopause, and the change in the hormone balance led to a, a, transfer, a sort of change in the nature of the migraines. But whatever happened, at this age, having spent 30, 40 years 
quietly reading, learning, working in the hospital, looking at the natural world, listening to the monks in the, in the, uh, in the church, in the abbey, and, and just surrounding herself with knowledge, she then feels the need to share it. And she goes out and she says, you, I'm compelled by great pressure of pains to make known what I've seen and heard. Now, she is also known as the Sybil of the Rhine because she had the ear of the most powerful individuals of the 12th century. All the kings, major kings and queens of Europe, she wrote to them, gave them advice. Emperor Barbarossa turned to her repeatedly, the Holy Roman Emperor, for guidance and instruction. And the Pope uh, endorsed her work as well. So when we think in these works, I'm going to tell you in a minute, there, there's some controversial stuff in here, but these, this powerhouse of male religious people are also you know, in, endorsing what she's doing. And she really can chastise them. This is her writing to the Pope. Um, you, you evil deceivers who labour to subvert the Catholic faith, you are wavering and soft, and thus cannot avoid the poisonous arrows of human corruption. Woo, heavy. I mean, she's laying in, and she's not going to be you know, punished. She's being supported. Amazing. She was also living through a very controversial time and she was not afraid to share her thoughts on it. At this point, going into the, uh, out of the 12th into the 13th century, there was um, a, really a rise in anti-Semitism and outright attacks on Jewish communities. And Hildegard does not want a part in this. She deliberately emphasizes the role of both Judaism and the church in terms of biblical scholarship. And at a time where this is not popular to be expressing these opinions, times of crusades, times of, of international conflict, she is, is happy to stand her corner and stand up for what she believes in. Um, she also is picking out men and criticising them for, for what they may have in terms, of a in terms of misogyny built into them. So again, to the Pope, she says, um, her visions had been rejected and criticised by many wise men because they come from this poor female figure who was formed in the rib and not taught by philosophy. There's a very sarcastic tone here, isn't there? That, you know, oh dear, I was made from Adam's rib, I'm just a little woman. Um, but actually what she's saying is, do not reject these secrets of God for they're part of that need which is hidden, which has not yet appeared openly. And we'll talk about this in the discussion, but this idea of not yet appeared openly, hidden in plain sight, there, but unseen. That really does seem to underline the role of women in the past. Um, and in terms of controversial opinions, she gives a very clear set of instructions for how to bring about an abortion. So this is what you need to do. And she also gives the first ever description of a female orgasm. And it is heady stuff. So please do enjoy while I chat. Um, I won't read it out because it's far too arousing. But in terms of uh, this idea of a nun who is supposed to be virginal, who is supposed to be uh, really not interested in matters of sex, that front cover, yes, I think you can see what it implies. And these, this content, this, in, in, this, this information that even today might be considered controversial within the church was supported by it. And I think this makes us see the medieval world differently. And I think it makes us see this whole question of the role of the church in suppressing women's rights differently. The whole way I've structured the book is starts off in the 6th century, 7th century, with the um, movement of Christianity across Europe and how it is women that are taking control of this. They are seeing in Christianity an opportunity for agency. And in fact, this goes right back to the birth of the church, the very early um, church when it was emerging in Rome. The very first patrons were women. So when you go to the places like Santa Pudenziana in Rome, that is named after the female patron who left all her wealth to the emerging church in order to, to found it and set it up. They could see the difference because in the classical world, in patriarchal societies, most religions are arranged where there are a privileged few who are allowed access into a temple, the priest or the priestess, and everyone else is kept outside. Or it could be the emperor and the empress that are allowed in, or the pharaoh. But there's a sense of them and us. 
What Christianity did, which I think was one of its USPs, really, what made it so popular, was uh, not only do you get a free eternal life thrown in for everybody and heaven, but also it, the body of the faithful, the church, is made up of everybody. And when you are an excluded group, that is an appealing idea. On top of that, add the opportunity for women to set up their own powerhouses, these convents, these spaces where they can own the land, they can manage all the trade and the industry and the money and the economics that's coming in and out of it, hand it on to their daughters so they can do the same thing. You can see why it could have been appealing right from the beginning. So what we think of as one of the most patriarchal institutions probably in the world today, the Catholic Church, was actually a vehicle for some of these women to, to find them the, a space for themselves. And this was certainly the case in what we call the 12th century Renaissance in Germany. There, this, uh, when, I, when I show you Hildegard as one individual, you think exceptional, extraordinary, a Van Gogh, a, you know, Da Vinci who just exists in a vacuum. She was surrounded by extraordinary men and women. And in convents all around Bingham, there are other women that we only have fragments of information surviving about. Um, there's, this is uh, Hedda of Landsberg. She wrote, and all her nuns, look at them, each of them drawn, each one individual, each one celebrated. Um, they were writing an, an encyclopedia, an illustrated encyclopedia and history of the world. It has been lost. That book has been lost. But it, if it had survived, she would have been up there with Hildegard. We've been talking about her. And other abbesses and nuns all across this region were exploring the limits of knowledge, pushing themselves intellectually. Um, I think the best way to understand her legacy is to, to read her... Uh, this isn't actually an obituary, this was written before she died, but it's written by Volmer, her scribe, lamenting in advance how he's going to feel when she dies. A little bit morbid. Who then will give answers to all who seek to understand their condition? Who will provide fresh interpretations of the scriptures? Who then will utter songs never heard before and give voice to that unheard language? Who will deliver new and unheard of sermons on feast days? Who then will give revelations about the spirits of the departed? Who will offer revelations of things past, present and future? Who will expound the nature of creation in all its diversity? Hildegard and a woman, a medieval woman. So I wanted to start with her. She actually comes in the centre of the book. The book runs, as I say, from about 600 AD up to about 1400 AD. Um, and she's, she's slap bang in the centre. But in every chapter, what I'm trying to do is challenge our assumption that women have always been the second sex and that our space has always been a domestic sphere. I was having a fascinating discussion uh, with um, people from the Rijks Museum earlier about gender, about identity. And I was saying there that in the course of writing this book, I found the origin of the phrase, a woman's place is in the home, was Calvin. And it was Martin Luther and the Protestants who began this domestication of women, the, the domestic sphere becoming the space of women. And it makes sense, really. I hadn't realized it, but if you think right up until the Reformation, Yes, the majority of women are living a very conventional life. They are having children, they're getting married, they're living, uh, running the home, that's their space. But there was this option, this extra, of being in a monastic environment, or in the case of some of the later women, actually being lay uh, mystics and lay um, spiritual individuals. But the fact that they were able to go somewhere else and explore their intellectual creativity, explore the limits of their knowledge. When the Reformation closed the monasteries, the monks were all given jobs within the church. They were paid off with a pension or they were moved over somewhere else into the new religious world. Women were told, that's it. We're closing all the convents and you just have to go to the home now. That's it, that's your lot. And since then, the last few hundred years have reinforced stereotypes that are transferable across uh, the world. If you're trying to transplant through colonialism an idea of identity and power, how do you streamline it? Men do this, women do this, and then you can take that identity and transplant it wherever the, the colonialism reaches. So we are victims of the last few hundred years, but there is hope 
that there was some other variants of women's positions within society, and there will be again. There's so much more I could tell you about so many individuals, but this book is about putting the power in your hands. The phrase I open it with is, you cannot be what you cannot see. And we have been, so many of us have been written out of the historical records. We haven't been able to see ourselves. So now we can go and find ourselves. This is just my little contribution. But every one of you now have the skills, the tools, the opportunity with the internet, with archives. Find the stories that are interesting to you and tell others about them. It's the best time to be engaging with the past. It's an exciting time to be engaging with the past. Thank you all so much for listening to me. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.